Um, welcome to the Chinese University of Hong Kong Shenzhen webinar series, and thank you very much for joining us. My name is Murray Johnson. I'm the Deputy Director of the International Admissions Team, and I'll be your host today. We expect today's session to last about one hour. I'll run through a few housekeeping for points first, and then we'll have uh, three wonderful student speakers to give short presentations about their experiences, and finally, we'll answer your questions. So first, uh, we are recording this information session. So if you enjoy it so much that you wish to watch it again, or you want to share it with a friend or colleague, we'll send you a link for the recording after the session is completed. Do please note, we have muted all other attendees um, other than the guest speakers and myself. This is to prevent interruptions or presentation difficulties. Um, but we definitely welcome your questions. So uh, please send any questions that you might have to the chat room. Uh, you should find a link to the chat room at the bottom of the page, and I'll share your questions with the students after they've done their presentations. Please note that today's presentation is about student experiences at CUHK Shenzhen. So these questions will be prioritized. If we have time at the end, uh, we'll deal with any admissions related questions then. Before we get started, I'd just like to do a quick poll um, just to get an idea about um, who we have here and what you're interested in. Um, obviously, each of our speakers is from a different school. So this is just to give us an idea about uh, who's here and, and who we're talking to. Um, um, so it looks like uh, about 50% of our uh, attendees here today are from the School of Science and Engineering, or, or most interested in the School of Science and Engineering, so that's great. Uh, Mugjan, when he talks, will be talking to a lot of you guys. 35% um, for Management and Economics, so Shanti will be talking in particular to you guys. And then good to see we've got uh, a few people who are from uh, HSS uh, and, uh, well, uh, Tori's kind of moving into that area at the moment. Um, and the people are uncertain, then I guess you'll hear from everyone. That's wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, so we'll get started with our presentations today. Uh, our first speaker is the most senior of our students um, presenting today. We, we did hope to have one of our fourth year students here, but unfortunately they're moving into exams next week and uh, priorities go to exams, of course. So uh, our first speaker is a third year student studying electronic information and engineering in the School of Science and Engineering. He's also president of the International Students Association. So ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to welcome Mark Shan, please. Um, hi, hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, depending on what time of the day it is. Uh, all right, I'll share my presentation real quick. All right, so my name is Makran and I am, uh, wait, can you see? And I am, uh, engineering student at the SSE, the Science and Engineering School at our university. I'm an electronic information engineering student and I'm in my junior year now. I myself, uh, I come from uh, Kazakhstan, which is like in Central Asia, right beside China. And usually people joke about us saying like, we're Russian speaking, Asian looking Muslim people. Um, yeah. So first of all, let's talk about the, what I'm going to talk about today. We have, uh, I'm going to introduce a bit of, about SSE uh, in general, about how to study there, the, st the stuff we do, and the uh, opportunities we get. And then I'm going to talk about the ISA, the International Students Association, and the kind of work we try to do uh, in the university. Uh, can somebody say, can you hear me well? Um, yeah, we can hear you fine, Magda, uh, and okay. see all your presentations. Yeah, okay. All right, so first of all, School of Science Engineering is, uh, you might have heard a lot of stereotypes, like, oh, you guys, we, got, we do a lot of work, and we stay up all night a lot of times, and it, a lot of times, and then it's uh, quite a bit of pressure. And there's definitely a truth aspect to this. Coming from studying in this background, it's... Uh, 
like I cannot sugarcoat it. It's quite a bit of work, but it pays off very well. Not necessarily in wages, but it's just in this uh, in knowledge and generally in expertise, and also in wages. Yeah, it's, it pays pretty well. Uh, so here is an example of the kind of work we do. Usually, we for each class we usually have to submit homework every week. Uh, for most of the classes, statistics, math, physics, uh, plenty of homework. We will do a lot of labs and then we'll have to submit a lot of lab reports. Uh, there, the computers do a lot of the work for us, but it's still quite a bit of work. Uh, but the fun part is a lot of times the labs that we actually get to work on the stuff hands-on, which, which is one of the major things why I joined engineering in the first place. Um, I myself uh, like, I would like to say that usually when you meet a business student, they will, they will be really good at presentations and you'll see later on Shanti's presentation is amazing. Uh, they're really good at group work. They're really good at presentations. They're super chatty, super social. And it's very often, not quite, but very, something like the opposite for uh, engineering students. We do a bit of group work, we do, uh, but it's mostly unofficial group work. We work together, we do our homework together in our unofficial study groups, and we end up staying up all night together. And it's kind of fun, I guess. It's our kind of group work. But a lot of times you will end up working alone. Uh, a lot of times your, all of your work is uh, individual, but you don't necessarily have to be solo. But it's individual work, it's your own project, your coding project, your uh, lab report, your homework, etc. cetera. Uh, but you will also have to encounter the fact that coming to university, especially to STEM majors, uh, you will have to try to balance your life in a way that wasn't uh, initially, that's not really present in your high school. Back in high school, when you study, the studies are not as intensive and maybe the aspect of the social life is slightly different. And there is this joke that you have to choose two. You have either good grades, enough sleep or social life. And during my first two years, I sacrificed the sleep aspect of it. So I had the okay grades and the great social life, but no sleep. Uh, which this, this, like, this little thing does ring true for some of us. Like you have to have uh, like sacrifice a bit of social life to have good grades because you cannot join any of the parties. You cannot join uh, a lot of the clubs if you're working really hard on your stuff, especially if you're doing some research in the labs with the professors uh, or you're trying to get A's and everything. You will not, you don't expect yourself to be very invested in social life. Uh, okay, apart from that, this might sound a little bit grim and, well, not so fun for engineering students, but obviously there is a fun aspect uh, which I, I'd like to go into a bit later. Uh, uh, so about my major, I'm an electronic information engineering student, and for most of you it will be probably make, probably makes no sense. Uh, so our major includes some physics quite a bit of calculus, a bit of programming, and a lot of hands-on stuff. So we'll draw, some di we'll draw the diagrams, try to work out circuits, work on circuits, work on communication systems. Uh, we'll do a lot of uh, hands-on work. We'll do a lot of analysis, a lot of signal analysis. And again, we'll do a lot of circuitry work. So this, as you can see here, we basically got se several chips, interconnected the chips, and I got to display from two bit code to uh, like a number code, you see? It's quite fun for most, for some people, I guess. Uh, a lot of people in my major, they love it. They love the hands-on stuff, it's quite fun. Unfortunately, because of the virus, we were not able to participate in the lab system. So those, those codes delayed. But uh, supposedly we were going to work with, on the Cortex IRM if we did have courses this year. Uh, but what about the other majors? Uh, apart from EIU, SSE also has computer science, new energy science, statistics, and math, right? 
And also the, this year they're introducing a substream for EIE called computer engineering, which is uh, great, amazing. All of these fields are very specific, very, that really depends on your preferences. Uh, and it really boils down to like several aspects. Like, do you like hands-on stuff? What's your main su subject of interest? Is it physics, chemistry, math? Uh, like linear algebra, like which branch of math? Do you like coding or not? Uh, some of my friends who were like, yeah, I love science and all, but I hate coding. They will go to new energy. Obviously, in, nowadays in any of these fields, you wouldn't be able to avoid coding because it's really necessary to draw up those graphs, to make those uh, calculations and etc. cetera. But, but still, like some of them are less coding dependent. Some of them are more coding dependent, like ComSci, obviously. Then there is the main subject. Do you like physics and chemistry? That's new energy. Do you like statistics more? Or do you like this very lean, very, very big, rigorous proofs, uh, very beautiful, well done proofs? That's statistics. And then math, there is the applied math, there is the pure math, and so on. Those are like, there is a, it's a special thing on, on its own. And then if you like physics and uh, basically like tinkering with electric, uh, electric uh, devices, EIE is where you go. ComSci is uh, for programming uh, a lot of the computer science stuff where you will work with plenty of math, but then be able to integrate it into our like more real world applications. Uh, and your major selection will often boil down to this. And I think all of these majors have their own merits and it really depends on the preferences and w what you like, what do you feel more, more comfortable about. And I'd like to give a little demonstration about what kind of work I do in EIE. This is, uh, and being an SSC student, most of us will have to study, every SSC student studies the same courses in their first year. So one, I'll do two demonstrations. One of them is from my first year course. And the other one is from uh, my third year course. So this is, uh, this is one of the projects in my first year, one of the last projects that we, everyone has to do in our first year. It's a Python coding project. And it's very, very simple machine learning algorithm. It's called a KNN distance uh, based algorithm where you are given, as you can see here, I'm given a file with these digits, zeros and ones, that form pictures, as you can see here. Five, two, one, eight, two, nine, nine, five. And then I have like bigger files with that stuff. I have like files with thousands of numbers. My pro the, what the project is supposed to do is take these files and I'm teaching this simple machine learning program to be able to tell what numbers are those in those pictures. Well, supposedly zero and one pictures. The professor made it a bit easier for us. Initial project was to make, have a JPEG picture and then the picture will have black and white, but then he made it easy with just ones and zeros. Uh, it's quite, it wasn't very easy. A lot of work was done by the professor. He gave us a lot of the clues, but Essentially, you learn the kind of thinking it requires to do this. Uh, and it's not that hard, if, honestly. Our first project was way harder. It's, he asked us to make a game. So I'm going to run this real quick. So as you can, as you can see, it's training. In, in the training, there's like 90 of each digit. And then it takes that information and takes another file and then I checks its own accuracy, right? And then we can see that the accuracy is 94% while testing time is six seconds. And our job is basically after you finish writing the code is to make it as accurate as possible for as little time as possible. And you have to use different mathematical theories. The one that we used was Hamming distance for KNN, but uh, don't, we don't need to go into the details. And then it's, t it's testing itself, beginning the predicting. And if you go into the, this file, I will predict, you can see five here, five, two, one, eight, five, two, one, eight, two, 
2995. So it's correct. Sometimes it's wrong. It really depends on each run is different. So this, I might bore some of you with this. I, I think quite a lot of business students, but for us, it seems very exciting a lot of times. I think it's very interesting. Then there is a project that we did for our uh, third year EIE. This is more uh, complex. This is a signal, uh, sig digital signal analysis and the sound analysis. But if dumbed down, basically, I take a I take a file with a musical sound, with a piano sound, any file, and then the, what the program does. You might not be able to share the sound. You might just have to explain, I'm afraid. All right. Okay, so it's basically playing the sound of the tune that I'm playing. And it's just a simple sound, ping, and whatnot, right? You choose a, any file, and then it displays a frequency band. Basically, it goes through a Fourier transform of the normal sound and displays all the frequencies that this sound has, all, all the fundamental frequencies. And then displays the frequency and the musical note. This is F4 sharp, and then there should be A4 14.9. This is a piano key numbers. Yeah, A4. So, so that's that. Uh, quite a bit of work. This is a final project, uh, so it's not like everyday thing, but it's definitely something to look forward to. It's quite fun, I think. Uh, so, back to our presentation. Uh, CompSci, New Energy students, we all do different kind of work. They do like chem labs, biology labs, statistics students have their own, they have even a specialized programming language called R just for statistics. And there's quite a bit of work. And uh, Moose pointed out that some of you might be wondering about the prerequ prerequisites for uh, SSE generally and like what kind of things should you learn before coming to make life easier for yourself and uh, in our first year we already study they already teach us the basics of calculus chemistry and coding uh, they already teach us this basics but in the same time okay well, but in the same time it's better to come prepared already so one of the most important things that I think everyone should uh, at least have some basics in is calculus and math. Uh, math is very important in engineering. It uh, cannot be looked down on and it's vital in every field. That's what chemistry and physics bases on a lot of times. So you will need a lot of knowledge about calculus, at least uh, basic knowledge of integration, differentiation and stuff like that. You will also need some knowledge about chemistry Although our teachers are great, we have quite a few great professors who will go with, through chemistry with you from zero. So it's, not, so it's not so necessary, but it's good to have some basis. And physics, I've met some students who never studied physics in their high school before. So they struggled a bit because in our first year we're studying mechanics and it's necessary for every student to study. It. Basically Newton's laws, fluid, fluids, uh, pressure, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody, uh, had to study it and we studied from zero, but students who never experienced physics before, they struggled because it requires a special kind of discipline on its own, a different kind of thinking. So that's said. And then Moose pointed out whether we need coding. Mm, I don't think so. It definitely gives you a head start. But when I first came in, I, I had zero experience coding and we, most of us also had zero experience coding, but we learned as we, as we went, which is, uh, Great. We have some great professors here, especially like programming major, uh, programming related stuff. Um, okay, so on from my major, I'd like to talk about a, a bit about the International Students Association. That is uh, what I what we do, <laughs> what what I am the president of. A lot of times, uh, I feel like. International students are being misrepresented in our university and sometimes the demands are not being met. So that's uh, what the, our association does. Our university generally has a lot of associations and clubs, a gaming club, cooking club, sports clubs, even a student union, which is a necessary thing. It represents a whole student body. But uh, sometimes I think I, ISA is uh, useful to help students adapt to the new realities of coming to China, coming to a new university, new climate, 
new people, different language, and, and so on. It will help address the issues that the university or student union overlooks. Sometimes they can't, it's not that they don't want to, but they cannot see these issues because they don't experience. Uh, so the issue, and then we address the university and student union issues. Sometimes things like uh, the language barrier, some of the, some of the bigger like seminars may be uh, only delivering papers in Chinese. So we ask them to maybe help us translate this and such and such. And also we organize activities to help students feel more at home to like kind of mitigate their longing for home. We have uh, different kind of nationality cuisine days, we have Mexican food days, Indonesian food days, plus we have the international day, the, like the biggest event that we do where people just gather together, we kind of do a little fair, we try to share each other's cultures, uh, have fun along the way, which is, I think is quite fun. We have, also we have like language courses that we ourselves, the international students provide. We have Russian language courses, Spanish, French. Uh, we try to do Baha'is Indonesia, but uh, it wasn't as popular among the Chinese students. So this is my uh, Russian course, the one that I teach. The, we went to the neighboring university, MSU, to take a look, I guess. And then this is a picture from this year's International Day, which is, uh, again, like I mentioned, the big activity that we do, and it's like a fair kind of thing. All right, uh, thanks for listening. Uh, all right, uh, hope you have questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Mark Chan. Um, with, with something like the International Students Association, it is a, a very good group for us to have here and they're helping us to uh, better understand the needs of international students at our university. So hopefully when you come to our university, you'll get involved with their group and their activities and uh, yeah, help us get a better understanding of uh, the needs of our students. Just a reminder that we'll welcome any questions you might have. Uh, just type them into the chat box at the bottom of the page. And if you're shy about the question you're asking and you don't want everyone to see, there is an option there where you can elect to send it just to me. And then you don't have to worry about everyone else seeing it. Moving on to our second speaker. Um, some of you may have met her. Uh, she's a second year student studying marketing and communications in the School of Management and Economics. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to Shanti. Okay. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me clearly? Yep, yeah. can hear you fine. Okay. okay, so let me introduce again myself. My name is Padma Shanti. You can call me Shanti. I'm from Indonesia and I'm year two students from SME. I take marketing and communications as my major. And today I will share my own experience studying in CHK Sinjan. And also I will share a little about SME. I do not know that Makzan prepared that much detail for SSE, so it may not comparable to Makzan's SSE. Uh, the first topic that I want to talk about is about the Chinese language. I have received a lot of questions like, is it okay if I don't understand any Chinese? And based on my own experience in the teaching process, in the learning activities, the teacher will use full English and you do not have to worry about any Chinese. Um, however, for some group projects, the teacher may want to combine the international students with the locals. And if you're the only international students in the group, then maybe your group member will discuss in Chinese. But of course, you can always remind them like friendly and politely. Can you guys please discuss in English? And most of them will respect you and yeah, problem solved. So you do not have to worry about any Chinese. And I also received a lot of questions like, do my Chinese improve in this full English environment? And I can say that for daily conversations, it's totally improved because I still have a lot of opportunities to practice my Chinese like with the cleaning service, security guards, or in the canteen, or even when I go up from campus, then most of the local people will not understand English, and it will be the best opportunity for you to learn your Chinese. Um, and then, um, yeah, but until now, I 
still cannot do formal presentations or formal speech in standard Chinese. But of course, it depends on the students itself and it will be different for each person. Uh, moving on, I want to share my applications. This is the real applications that I currently have on my phone. So it is really useful and you may want to download these applications. The first one is for VPN. So as you guys may know that in China, international applications are banned, like Instagram, YouTube, Google. So you have to access those applications with VPN. And if you are connected to the school's Wi-Fi, actually you will automatically connect to the Hong Kong server. So you are able to access Google and those international applications. Um, however, I personally feel like the speed and the quality of the school's VPN is not good enough if you want to uh, open the entertainment applications like Instagram and YouTube. So you may want to download the free or the premium VPN, it's up to you. And the second one is for the e-commerce. In China, there are a lot of e-commerce. The most famous one is Taobao. It's so easy to use and the products are cheap and good. So yeah, you may want to download Taobao. For the translator application, I personally use Pleco, but you also can use the WeChat feature for translation. It's already good enough. The next one is Waimai and Alama. It actually like food service delivery, like Uber Eats or GrabFood, GoFood. So yeah, it's also really helpful. The next one for transportation, TV is like Uber or Grab. So it's a taxi service. And Metroman, in Shenzhen we use Metro. So Metroman will show you the full map and also the time and price estimation. The next one is Tencent Maps. Uh, it's like Google Maps, but it doesn't require VPN. So you also can download any other Maps application, but make sure that it doesn't require VPN to use it. And the next one is the most important one, WeChat. I think most of you already know about WeChat. It's really important for you to have one in China. You can do everything in WeChat. I don't think you can survive in China without WeChat, actually. And for the last two applications, it is kind of required from our school. Blackboard is learning platform. Uh, so assignment, quizzes, everything will be on black. Everything will be on Blackboard. And then for any conversations like reminders, news, announcement, everything will be delivered to our school's email. So I use Outlook. I don't know whether you can use any other applications. Uh, the next one for the cultural differences. Uh, let me remind you again that this is my own assumption, my own experience as an Indonesian, as a girl. So don't generalize this and don't judge me. Uh, the first one is about eating alone. I feel like that eating alone is really lonely and really sad. But for the Chinese people and some of my international friends, especially the boys, they feel like eating alone is okay and normal. And of course in university, it needs more effort to ask your friend to go eat together because, uh, yeah, because we have different timetables and uh, we have different things to do during the lunch or dinner time. Uh, the second one is organized. Um, all of my Chinese friends, I feel like they're more organized than me and they really strict to the rules. Like my former roommate, they have to turn off the lights every 10 p.m. and they have to go to sleep before 11. It's, it's even, they, did, they do that even on the weekend, so I'm kind of shocked about that, but that's a good thing to learn. Uh, the third one is hate alarm. They really hate alarm. I think it's for some people, we need alarm to set couple of times so we can get up in the morning and the Chinese really hate that and I think it's important for us to discuss with the Chinese at the first time we come into the room like what rules we want to have in that room so there will be any problem in the future and the last one is about the seasons in Indonesia there are only two seasons so when I came to China and there are four seasons, it's kind of different. Even though the temperature is not extreme, 
like in the summer, the highest temperature may be 32 or 35 degrees, but at some days it feels so humid and you feel like you're going to sauna all day long and you have to bring umbrellas every day. And in the winter, the lowest temperature may be like eight or five. Uh, yeah, it's not too extreme compared to other countries, but still, it's still feel different for me who came from two seasons countries. And one more thing that I forget to edit in the presentations is for the casualty. Uh, compared to Indonesia, the casualty in sewage case engine is really more casual. Uh, we do not need to use specific uniform to this class. Like I think in Indonesia's university, you still have to use white shirt and do formal dress. But in Savage Kids Intent, it's up to you. You can wear anything you want to wear. Um, at, um, but it's have to be appropriate, I think. <laughs> but yeah, no one will scold you for that. So the next one, I will talk about the SME. It's more interesting than Magzan's SSE. I can make sure about that. Uh, no, I'm joking. The first one is for the group projects. There are a lot of group projects in SME. Um, every course requires group projects. It can be presentations, essays, even only discussions. It's always in the group design. So it's really good for you and a very good opportunity for us, the international students, to be uh, broaden our network, broaden our ideas, become more familiar with the Chinese culture, how they think, how they solve problems. So group project is really useful. And our topics, our assignments are usually based on the current trends. Like my latest exam, uh, we discuss about the Ocean Park Hong Kong bankruptcy. Like we have to analyze the company and we have to formulate a strategy for them to uh, avoid those those bankruptcy and I think that's interesting because so you have to you also have to follow the current trends what is happening all over the world so yeah it will help you a lot in the SME courses uh, the next one is about the importance initially I feel like SME courses are not important like it's so simple and easy that it doesn't require specific university teachings uh, however, in the real life, it's not as simple and as easy as that because I don't know with the other university, but I think the Sewage Case Engine prepared their students to become the top management level, not like the lower level. Okay, uh, unfortunately, we seem to have lost Shanti's presentation, um, maybe having some uh, connection problems there. So, what we might do is we might come back to, to Shanti. Uh, are you there, Shanti? Yeah, I'm sorry. Am I locked out? No, it's okay. You're back. Okay, okay. please continue. Okay, actually, I'm done. That's all for our okay. presentations. It's perfect. The timing is perfect. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then, then, then Shanti takes a bow and uh, walks off stage, right? Um, thank you very much for that. And. Uh, if you do have more questions about um, management and economics in the business school, then uh, please let us know and we can pass them on to Shanti afterwards. Um, our final speaker is a freshman at CUHK Shenzhen. She actually started in science and engineering, but uh, soon after starting, she decided that actually she's more interested in applied psychology and is therefore um, in the process of moving across to the School of Humanities and Social Sciences. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tori. Are you going, Tori? Can you... Uh, she says she cannot unmute. Can you hear me? All right. She's saying that some uh, program is here. She cannot unmute. Just give us a minute while we try and... Start. Hello. Ah, there we go. Cool. Okay. Awesome. Uh, I'm just going to share my... Screen. <laughs> you disabled the screen sharing. For me, I mean. Can you, Miss? Yep, just setting it up now. Oh, okay, awesome, thank you. Um, okay, so I'm going to be talking about just 
daily lifestyle of a CUHK student. And um, just a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Victoria Chamberlain. I'm from California. I moved to China when I was in high school. And like Moose said, I first started off as an SSE student, but I'm moving into uh, the HSS school. So um, I know that that's not a lot of people who are interested in HSS, so I'm not gonna talk about it much. Uh, but if you guys have any questions, you can like totally um, maybe pri private message me and we can talk about it. So just keep on going with my presentation. So um, in the daily life of a CUHK student, you are supposed to wake up for morning classes. Um, but you know, like a good student, you wake up just in time for your morning class. So you usually just grab a snack uh, from your dorm and just go to class. But in that rare occasion that you have time for a breakfast, you can either make yourself a breakfast at the dorm kitchens, or you can go to a canteen, uh, one of the five canteens around campus, uh, which include for breakfast, usually baozi, rice, or kongji. It's usually a Chinese style breakfast. And after morning classes, you can grab lunch at canteens. This time the lunches are usually Cantonese or Chinese, but there's also a few uh, international style, like Korean foods in there. After your lunch, you can grab snacks at a tea, at the tea shop on campus or the bakery, or we also have a brand new Starbucks. So that one also works. And uh, you might want that snack because Late classes can last until 7 or 8 p.m. And that goes beyond dinner, which you can also grab at canteens. But there's also alternatives to these canteen meals, which is like, you know, I said before, you can cook your own food in the dorm kitchens. And I will explain where you can get groceries uh, later. But there's also the option of using food apps as Shanti described before, such as Meituan or Olema. And you can have these foods delivered to you in two ways and because there's two campuses. You have the lower campus and the upper campus. In the upper campus, you have three dorms, which is where most of the students live, and you have one canteen, a 7-Eleven, and you also have sports and gym facilities. The upper campus has more of a community because you have more than one dorm, most of the students live up there, and it's kind of like a, just a big family because you all have to suffer through going through the buses to get up to upper campus. I'll talk more about the buses later. But lower campus, where I live, uh, it, it's super efficient. You have classrooms. You, you can just walk to classrooms. You don't have to take any bus. You can walk to classrooms, but it's only one dorm. So you'll, you have a, the minimum amount of students there. Uh, you have more access to the canteens because there's four canteens uh, at the lower campus as well. Upper campus, you only got one. And you have the big sports facilities, the gym, and easier access to the two libraries, classes, and canteens. Oh, I just realized my camera isn't on. Okay, it's better. Um, Talking about the buses that go between the two campuses, you have a scheduled bus that people from upper campus usually take. Uh, people from upper campus usually take the, uh, <laughs> the bus to go to lower campus to go to their classes or to get to the library or anything. Upper campus has study rooms as well, but the library is just, it's bigger and it's better. Um, but the buses are on a scheduled, routine. So it's best to align your wake up routine, your whole daily activities to the buses. I think they around they arrive every three to five minutes, sometimes eight minutes, and they're usually on time. Uh, but there is in the morning, if there's a popular class, a lot of people usually in the mornings, there could be a long line. So it's best to plan your schedule around the bus schedules. Um, so, talking about the dorms, we have four dorms. We have Shaw, Harmonia, Muse, and Diligentia. So Shaw is the one that I live in, which is in the lower campus. Harmonia, Muse, and Diligentia are all in the upper campuses. And all these dorms have about the same structure. Uh, well, they're a little bit different, of course. Can't have them all be the same but they essentially have the same facilities. They have shared bathroom. Each floor has a shared bathroom. 
and showers. Kitchens, usually you have two floors sharing one kitchen, but it's never get, it never gets crowded. There's not a lot of people cooking all the time. So that's all, that's fine. It's all good. And uh, it's usually common for international students to share a room with either two or three Chinese students. And it might sound rough at first, but once you get to know them, they really help you with your Chinese. And it's just, it's a good opportunity to learn about the Chinese culture and just to put your foot in to that idea of, uh, you know, adapting to China because this is probably your first time uh, living this long in China. Oh, I almost forgot one thing. Um, these dorms also have recreational rooms where students can make reservations to apply to use the rooms. For example, there's the music room, dance room, art room, sculpture room, there's even a tea room. Um, and you can make your reservations using, uh, like online, using the website. Um, and all you have to do is during that time, scan your card to the door, it would open and you are free to use that room for however you reserved it for. The next thing we'll talk about is the free time. Uh, the free time that, you know, Mag Jana talked about within that triangle thing. This is what, you know, after your classes, after your studies, you feel confident and you, you feel like you have time to do other activities than studying. This can include joining a sports team. For example, I'm in the volleyball team. There's also a basketball team, a badminton team, and I'm sure you can find more. Or you can even start your own team as long as you have enough people. <laughs> but yeah, there's a plenty of sports you can do. There's also opportunities to hang out or go shopping off campus. We have a, a big mall nearby, maybe about five to ten minutes away, using a bus or a taxi, either one, called Coco Park. And there you got you got karaoke what do you call it? karaoke rooms? It's a place to do karaoke. Um, you also got the Coco Park, I guess, which has just a bunch of shops, restaurants, and it, it's just really good. I, it, I recommend if you ever go to Coco Park, Lava Stone has the best steak. It is so good. Anyways, uh, Magjan talked about the student clubs, of course, like the video game club, the art club, the, <laughs> the drama club. There's a lot of clubs that we have, and if you find one, if you don't find any that, you know, suit your preference, you can make one yourself. It's, as, as long as it, like, you know, you like the club, and you have a passion for it, and you feel like you have the responsibility to uphold this club, then go ahead. But it's also important to manage your time, uh, like your study time within all this outside activities. So you don't become overstressed, overworked, or maybe even like underworked. So you just forget your responsibilities. That's, that's not good either. So you want to find a good balance between free time and work. And talking about that shopping around uh, outside campus, honestly, it's a bit limited around Longang, where the university district is. It's a, it's a bit limited, but... There's big cities around Shenzhen, like Lohu, Hutian. Those are huge shopping districts, huge and pretty popular. It's, always, it's almost always crowded <laughs> uh, because it's just, it has so many things to do. Like there's escape rooms, there's huge malls, there's foods of every country over there. It is just a huge, huge city with so many things to do, so many experiences you can try. Uh, the second city or district is Shukho, which is where I came from. I, I live there right now. Um, Shukho is a big international community area. So people there are, they're, they're usually well, uh, well adapted to talking to international people because there's just such a big community of internationals there. So with all those international people, there also comes international groceries. So, of course, you can buy international groceries um, back in the malls nearby campus, like in Wonka. Wonka is a shopping mall nearby our campus, about five minutes away by bus. There's international groceries there, but Shoko has many international grocery stores. 
And so if you go to Vanka and you don't find the thing you're looking for, like the specific international ingredient or international food, uh, you can, <laughs> if you don't find that specific international food, you can always go to Shoko and browse their many options. Or I go to Shoko like once a week, honestly, because I love that place. It's just a big international family. Um, and it's just very westernized, you know? But I go there often. So if you ever want something international like, international groceries, um, you can totally just ask me and I can go see if there's any of that in the shop, in the shops, grocery stores, anything within that district. And to get to these areas, you usually have to take a bus, metro, or DD. Buses and metros are, are the cheapest, of course, but they do take longer. Buses, I would say about two hours. Metro, probably about uh, one hour, 30 minutes, or one hour, 45 minutes. But a DD would take an hour. Yeah, it took me an hour to get to my school today. <laughs> um, yeah, a DD takes an hour, but it also costs about 150 RMB each time, which is about uh, maybe 25 to $30, I think. Um, but that's only one way. So going back is another 25 to $30. Of course, it's the fastest way, but bus and metros are a lot cheaper. Um, and, you know, if anyone has any questions about HSS, feel free to ask me because I don't want to take up more time because I heard we're over time. So, thank you guys. All right. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much, Tori. Um, all right, so we're going to move on to uh, question and answer now. We have got a few questions which have come in. Um, and uh, just going to uh, pose a few of these questions and uh, see if you can give your thoughts about answering them. So one of the first questions that has been answered because we've been talking in previous presentations with students about online learning. Um, and we've been talking to people about the fact that uh, this semester was taught online. Would any of you like to explain how you found online learning this semester? Uh, it was a bit unsettling, definitely. It was uh, not easy to get used to. But quite to be quite honest, I think the way our university handled it was pretty well done. We only delayed our overall term by one week, which is I think is quite commendable. Um, of course, there I have heard complaints on like Reddit that other universities will put more workload on students because it's supposedly, oh, it's online new learning, everybody's at home, it's easier. You have more time, therefore you can do more work, which at least from my experience, we didn't have. Actually, a lot of the courses became more lenient because of this. The professors understood that we are still facing some problems. Uh, they will, uh, will they pro we changed some of the exams so we had midterms for some courses, but then they changed to midterm projects. Some things like uh, presentations, some things like that, they got canceled and then we got more grades will be derived from our homework and then less will be derived from our exams. But also one problem that I think is the biggest one from the academic standpoint is that number one, we didn't get to do any of the labs, none of the PE courses could actually happen. And then the other one was that we still, have, some of us are still have, still have to take exams in August. So some of us didn't do our final exams in May because it requires offline participation. So a lot of us will go to, you know, to school in August to do the exams. So that's it, I guess that's my perspective. Okay, thank you. Uh, Shanti or, or Tori, do either of you want to talk about your experience of online learning? I think I want to add that Indonesian internet compared to Chinese are really bad. Like at some points, our connection, 
like like mine before it can be sometimes disturbing and i know that's not the school's problem but yeah that become one of the problems for me and for the other indonesians in the online teaching process and also like i said before that in sme there are a lot of presentations and i personally feel like presentations is one of the international students advantages like we can do better we can gain more scores in presentations so when doing the online presentations and you do not get the nervous you do not get the uh those kind of presentation feelings uh the international students may get lower score than the normal class settings that's from me Oh, my you put two? Uh, only if you, if you have anything you want to add, then you can. Um, everything I thought was said already. Uh, yeah. But I just thought that the teachers, there are different methods on how the teachers kind of adapt to it. Like, for example, I had a professor that just recorded the videos and sent us the recorded videos, which was, it was great. It was fine. Um, but, you know, it lost interaction within the with the professor of course but then there were other professors who wanted to keep that interaction in exchange for like you might have terrible internet but at least uh you can try to talk to the professor one-on-one -on -one. um or not one-on-one -on -one, i mean you know just in the class you can have a discussion uh so there are different professors that like to adapt different styles in this situation and um i thought it was very interesting to see that and it was kind of fun to see you know the different methods they use yeah i know i know in conversations i've had with professors too we've had mixed opinions some professors have said they actually have found they can do more things online that they can't do in the classroom so there's there's benefits and uh, pros and cons all this sort of stuff um next question that we received is how have you found learning chinese Um, okay. <laughs> you, you go, you go, you go. Um, no, no, ladies first, I'm sorry. And I'd like you to do it in Chinese, please. <laughs> um, well, okay, then that's not, that's, uh, ni hao, uh, da jia hao, um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> so, I've actually learned, uh, Chinese two years prior to coming to this university, and, uh, Coming to this university, they make you take like a a placement exam to see where you would end up in in like in introduction, beginner, intermediate, advanced. Um, and the placement test, I think, is good. Yeah, I mean, if you try, you get put in the correct classes, you know. <laughs> um, but from then on out, like I got into the intermediate class, and the teacher. I thought she was very interactive and she taught me Chinese, of course, as you can tell. Um, but just learning here, learning Chinese here definitely is a lot better than learning in a different country, like starting off in the US learning Chinese. You can't really apply Chinese anywhere else except for that class because, you know, the language is English and you don't really use Chinese to, you know, buy groceries or, um, call a taxi, you don't use Chinese for that, you use English. But here in China, you have to use Chinese or you're just gonna end up looking dumb, typing on your phone <laughs> on Translate. And um, it's just, it's a lot easier to learn in an environment where it is super useful. That was it for me. Magjan or Shanti? Uh, actually, I think for me personally, I already studied Chinese from seven or eight years old because I have Chinese courses in my schools. However, I never get the opportunity to practice my Chinese in back in Indonesia. So when I come to China, I just need the opportunity to practice my Chinese and yeah, the improvement quite fast if you have a little background of Chinese study. 
and yeah that's worked for me but like i said before it didn't mean that after i graduate from cohk i can uh, fluently speak in chinese something like that i don't think that at least that doesn't work for me <laughs> so yeah that's for me um for me i also came like i lived in china for maybe like eight years or so uh, i studied high school in china too so my experience a bit skewed but from what i can tell basically we have different classes for different levels there is a beginner uh intro there is a introductory the beginner intermediate and then there is uh, advanced levels each one of them is very very like appropriate i think i was in the advanced level which was hsk 6 and above and it's uh the teachers are very awesome and back in back when i was studying what we like what we did was that there is a platform called the chairman's bow which is basically a news article platform that that uh, allows you to read articles in chinese and then you can sort them from hsk1 to hsk6 on different levels to make sure that like you you're reading the article that specific to your that is specific to your level and that is really great because it helps you learn so we were able to talk to the teacher to our chinese teacher and then we were able to push through free access to this platform because it's a paid platform but then we were able to push through for like university access uh, which was great i think our teachers are really responsive and they're really willing to help nevertheless uh nevertheless uh yeah it's quite it's not very easy. I think Chinese classes were one of the most pressurized classes of that term. You have to do a presentation every two weeks, as there's an essay every two weeks. There is a, very, a lot of learning, which uh, I, quite frankly, I think is really good. I have a small tip. Uh, if you're taking the placement exam and your Chinese is good, you can fail the exam on purpose to get better grades because you, they will put you in the beginner class, which uh, some of my friends did but uh, I wasn't smart enough. Just uh, following up about that, um, Karim has asked about, uh, do you need to know Chinese before you enroll at CUHK Shenzhen? The answer is definitely not. Um, all courses are taught in English and actually quite a few of our international students come in with very little or no Chinese. Um, quite a few of our teachers, international teachers speak very little or no Chinese. So uh, no, you don't need to know Chinese, but you will do Chinese classes while you're here. Um, and again, it's, it's a polite thing to do, to, to learn Chinese. Uh, let me see, next question. Um, kind of expanding on this, uh, someone else has actually asked while this conversation has been going on. So if I need to go to hospital or do some sort of task where I have to use Chinese, how do I do this? Can I answer? Uh, oh, okay, go, oh, yeah. go ahead. You do. Uh, okay, so there are several solutions, obviously. Uh, a bit of street smart and uh, several solutions. So the worst case scenario is that you take your translator uh, or you take your phone and then you try to translate it while at the hospital. Uh, the worst case scenario, been there, done that, not good. Then there's the second best scenario where you get your friend who's probably, you probably will have some local friends and because you live with, there will at least, there will be at least two Chinese students in your dorm. You will probably meet someone you're, while you're studying, obviously, and then you'll pro you might be able to like talk them into going with you. Uh, and the third case scenario is that uh, we as the ISA uh, try to help freshmen, freshman students with this stuff. So, the students will be allocated into groups, like groups of 10 or eight, and each group has their own mentor. And the mentor is usually somebody more senior than you. So they'll have more experience, they'll probably speak Chinese, so they'll probably be able to help you out with this, like go with you and do this. Back when I was a mentor, I helped out my, yes, Shenzhen is located in Guangdong. Back when I was a mentor, I helped out my friend, well, back, back then a mentee and a friend, who, be, who came late, so he had to do some police registration and stuff like that. So uh, 
I had to walk around with him and just help him out with that. There will be plenty of help if it's uh, if you def if you ask for it. Tori, did you want to answer further, or are you happy with Mugshan's answer? Oh, my bad. I forgot to add that there's actually quite a few uh, Chinese doctors who speak pretty well English. Mm. Uh, if you ask the right people, for example, um, a few of the doctors I've talked to actually recommended me doctors who can, doctors off campus, of course, who can speak English and they gave me their contact and it was fine from there. I didn't need to bring anyone because they spoke English. Um, and, you know, as long as you ask, and ask the right people, I'm sure you can find a good doctor who you can communicate with. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, you, you also find there's a lot of other options around too. So um, the IEEESO, the International Scholars and Students Service Organization, um, provides assistance to international students. And within your tower, you also have, uh, within your accommodation, you also have wardens and RTs who can help you. Um, can I add something? Yeah, please. So I think in Chinese, uh, they provide more Chinese medicine rather than international medicine. There are limited um, stock for the international medicine. So if you guys have some specific medicine that you have to eat from your own country, you may want to bring it by yourself and mm. yeah, stock it first. Yeah. And uh, there are a lot of Indonesians that chat me privately. I think it's better for you to chat on the and tag everyone rather than tag me because I do not have enough time to answer you one by one. <laughs> yeah, if you do, if you do have questions, then do send them to all of us and we can get answers. Uh, like we, I know we're past 4 p.m. now. Um, we'll probably go for another five to 10 minutes. Um, but we're not going to get through all the questions that we've got. So uh, do please send them to us and we'll, we'll find ways of getting answers for you. Um, the next question that I've got here is, uh, do you know what percentage of students, international students keep their scholarships after year two? Um, obviously to keep your scholarship, you need to get a GPA of 3.0. Um, I'm actually not entirely sure what the, the proportion is, but if you guys have any ideas. No. Shanti, uh, okay, wait. So basically, uh, the, the issue of the scholarship in general is this question is very sensitive in a sense, because not a lot of students are willing to disclose whether they pay the school or not. And a lot of us are not, uh, unless you're really close to somebody, they will not tell you like, oh yeah, hey, my GPA is this and this. Uh, unless their GPA is 4.0, it will be 10 But uh, they will also probably not tell you whether they lost the scholarship or not. It's a, more of a sensitive topic, so it's really hard to get any data on this. Uh, I wouldn't say, like, I wouldn't say anything, to be honest. Yeah, it, it's... It's difficult to, to know. I mean, this is kind of confidential information. Um, in terms of a definite answer for that, uh, just to, to, to remind, to keep your scholarship, you must get a GPA of 3.0. And that is quite difficult. Like it is, it is a challenge. You're going to have to work hard to keep a GPA of 3.0. It's not impossible by any means. Um, there, there's plenty of people who can keep GPA of 3.0. But uh, it, is, it is hard work. So uh, you've got to work hard when you come here. Um, I noticed that there's people talking about dormitories and we have got a few questions here. Um, one of the questions was, what are the most common problems that you have with your roommates? And I guess, how do you solve them? Um, well, you know, whenever one of the biggest problems that people have with their roommates are that the your roommates won't tell you that they have a problem with what you're doing and they'll just go straight to complaining to a higher up, maybe like your resident tutor, they'll go complain to them or maybe your warden and then you'll just get in trouble 
<laughs> you'll get in trouble for something you didn't know that your roommates didn't like. And so when I avoid this problem by just being straight up with them and just saying, please, please, please tell me if you have something that I'm bothering you about, please tell me, I will fix it. <laughs> you don't have to, you know, hide it from me. I will fix it and I promise I won't be mad. <laughs> So that usually works. Well, it works for me. I'm not sure about anyone else's. Um, but yeah, that was one of the big problems that I had before. It's all good now. Shanti or Majan, any suggestions for common roommate problems? Um, mm, yeah. I think for me, like some international students that I know usually like to make noise in the room like because maybe we are used to have our own private room so we may taking calls playing video games in the room and it may disturb the Chinese because the Chinese usually study in the room and and like Tori say usually they do not want to directly speak to us and that's the biggest problem but what I can say is that we also have to respect the Chinese that um, do not feel like this also my room uh, I can do whatever I want um, I don't think that's how it works so yeah I think if we respect each other then it's okay yeah I'd like to add on to that so here's uh, several questions about uh, moving out and uh, choosing your roommates mm -hmm. uh, well first of all you are free like you're allowed to move out of the dorms to live outside there is some there is some paperwork to go along with it, but it's generally possible. I have a few friends who do that. Uh, you are allowed to move to a different room and choose your own roommates after year one. Uh, so if you're like unsatisfied with uh, your roommates, which can happen, quite frankly, uh, I did that not because I was unsatisfied, but because I wanted to get together with my friend, and so like so three of us got together and then we picked up another friend and then we fill the room of four that is uh, possible obviously you don't choose your roommates it's a random system but from what i heard they have two international students and two local students starting from last year i think back they had used to have one international student and three chinese students and then also another question was can i, ask the, can I answer the question about foundation or are there any more questions about uh, the dorms um, uh, just quickly about roommates and stuff like this, uh, the only other thing which I'd add here is just uh, every floor has RTs and management teams to help you. So if you have problems, you can always put in an application to move. Um, the accommodation on campus can be challenging, um, but it also, once you find the right people to live with, it can be a very good experience to have too. So. Um, yeah, sure, Mark Johnny, if you want to move on. So there's a question about, uh, do we do a foundation program first or do you go straight into your major? Okay. Uh, wait, I'd like to add about the dorm stuff. So every floor has a, there, every floor has a supervisor and the supervisors are kind of like, they're, they're called tutors and you're welcome to address them if you have any questions, problems, even like they're well, they're often very nice and kind. So they'll, part of their job description is to like, help you out if you're feeling psychologically challenged, I'd say, if you're feeling down, basically, like if you have depression or some issues with yourself, they'll be willing to help out, talk to you and be nice to you. All of them will be speaking English and Chinese, so that's great. And also there are wardens, which is basically, there are several blocks, right? The, each college has A, B, C, D block, uh, and every block has its own warden, and warden is a professor who is willing to help you out with those kind of questions too. And they're uh, like quite good at it, I guess. Concerning the foundation program, you will not, no, you will not do a foundation program. Basically you will have a four year study at our university, right? And you choose your school from the beginning. Before coming to our school, I think it's still on, I think it's still on. Before coming to our school, there's like one month period before the school where they teach you a bit of Chinese and a bit of math, just so that you have more foundational knowledge about the stuff. But there is no necessary necessity like in usual Chinese universities where you have to do one year of foundation in Chinese and then pass that test and whatnot. Um, yeah, that's it. Okay, 
Cool. Yeah, uh, first year is kind of a foundation year within the school you choose. So you don't choose your major. Um, so for example, Marjan's doing electronic information engineering. He would choose that at the end of first year, but he would go straight into the School of Science and Engineering to start with. Um, a slightly specific question here. Do any of you guys play table tennis? Um, we had a question about the table tennis club and I replied and said yes, but just wondering if any of you do play table tennis and can comment on table tennis playing skills at CUHK Shenzhen. Shanti is really good. I'd be Shanti <laughs> also. No, I think the Chinese people are really good at table tennis. Like international students compared to them are not really good actually. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know what to talk about table tennis. I start playing table tennis only at CUHK Shenzhen. Can you talk a little bit about the, the facilities and, and where you play? Oh, and uh, play? I'm sorry that, can you hear the moss sound? Yeah, yeah it, is, it's very is quiet. That okay? <laughs> Isn't it like prayer time, YouTube. one of the five prayers, after afternoon prayer? Okay, so there is a specific room, special room for table tennis and I don't know how many tables is that on the room, on the Diligencia second level. The gym, oh, upper yeah. gym, how many tables are there? Six, seven, I think it's more than six, definitely more than six. Definitely more than six, maybe ten tables? Yeah, it's like yeah. right under the gym. Yeah, and yeah, you can always play there without any bookings. You only need to put your student ID on the gym and uh, sign up your name, then you can use the room freely and you can also borrow the racket what do they call <laughs> oh the bat and the balls yeah, yeah no but also there is a like there is another table tennis place on lower campus right in the latian i ah, know liwen liwen there's a room no in it's already moved to the upper campus ah okay i see all right i, I thought that we had two all right no we do have tennis billiard uh snooker Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we've got one last question and then we'll finish up. Um, and this is just about how many international students there are at the university. Um, now, I'm not expecting you guys to give a, a specific answer to this, um, but I guess what I'd like you to just comment about is um, how often do you feel you see international students around campus? Every time I look in the mirror. Quite often, I guess, the majority of the international students is uh, Indonesian. Uh, so you will see them basically every third person you meet is probably an international student. And you will know because they're usually louder than the local students. <laughs> um, I think for the international students, because I have a I play, I get along with the international students, especially the Indonesians. So my roommate also all Indonesians and that is why I see international students every day. And we also usually uh, plan to go to class together and we take the same class and that's why we always see each other. And also starting last year, I think there are a lot more uh, exchange students rather than uh, two last years. So yeah, it's more white people, <laughs> not only Indonesians. Yeah, at the moment, the, the undergraduate student population, which is um, full time, is about five to six percent of the student population. Um, as Shanti mentioned, we also do have a number of uh, exchange students who come over, especially from Europe and America, for one or two semesters. Um, and then there's often postgraduates who are on campus too. Uh, so the vast majority of students on campus are Chinese, but you will find that you can meet international students quite easily. Um, and as Mugjan actually mentioned too, we've actually got uh, Moscow State University opening across the road. So you'll probably find there's actually a lot more Russians around in the coming months and years. No, oh, wait, they, um, they are all open actually. The, Sorry, I actually have several friends from there. They, yeah, it's just that they 
moved there, like they had a temporary place to study in, and then now they moved to an actual good looking place. Yeah. Uh, yeah. On, I guess. Okay, so we'll finish up there. Uh, I think we've answered the main questions. There are a few others which we'll answer uh, privately. Um, but again, if anyone does have questions, then do please feel free to send them through to us and we'll be happy to answer. So, uh, Magjan Shanti and Tori, thank you all very much for your time. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. Um, we're considering what uh, other information sessions to have in the future. So do please stay tuned and we'll send you emails with those that we're planning. But otherwise, that will do for now. Thank you and good afternoon.